Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar using machine learning to understand and predict marketing ROI, sponsored today by Altrix. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Raz Neister and Scott Charlson. Raz is the Chief Data Scientist at at Kiris US. He comes from a background in the physical science where he learned to use computers to help people understand complex problems. And Scott joined Altrix in January of 2016 as the marketing director of channel demand generation strategy and programs. At Altrix, Scott and, uh, engages with partners and customers to address their challenges with self-service data analytics. And with that, let me turn it over to Raz and Scott to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you. This is uh, Raz from Kiris. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone today. Please do let us know if, if you're having trouble uh, hearing or seeing the presentation. What a great topic uh, we'd love to share with you today. This is one of the hot topics in the market that uh, certainly we've come across at a lot of our clients. And I think we can, uh, in about an hour, really drill through and trying to understand how we can leverage some of these new age and bleeding edge machine learning tools to do some really, uh, um, you know, this, um, market shattering and kind of really cool analytics predicting marketing ROI. So with that, thank you for everyone for, for joining us here today. Uh, we'll go through, before we even get to that, I'd just like to set the stage a little bit, um, talk about a little bit of who's curious and how we use all tricks in our sort of day to day. Um, we take a, uh, also a little bit of time to sort of set up the, the sort of landscape in the industry. We'll be focusing on the CPG or retail sector specifically, but these types of analytics that we'll see here today can really be used in, in multiple verticals. If there's one message that you should take out of today is that the time to really answer your big picture initiatives is now. Uh, if, if you forget everything that we talked about and all the details, just remember or that the time to really start pushing on your big picture strategic initiatives is now. And, and that's really like the, the, the fire I'd like to light in, in everyone's uh, uh, stomachs and in their bellies here today. We've seen a kind of big shift in, in a lot of uh, our sectors and a lot of our clients in the last maybe eight months or so where everyone's starting to, to use like these, these new uh, machine learning AI platforms to really uh, you know, do some of the, the really cool and advanced analytics. Specifically here today, we're going to cover two kind of themes or two problems that have popped up a lot in our work in the CPG space. We'll talk about what CPG is in, in, a, bit, in a second. Um, but these are, these are kind of like very fundamental problems. The first is, is who are my customers? If I'm a company that is producing goods or importing goods, Who's actually buying my stuff? Do we even have a clear visibility on that? And if they are, and if I'm, I'm in a very competitive marketplace with very tight margins on, on my supply chain, what's the best way to market to people so that, you know, they, when they walk into a store, they pick my product up off the shelf instead of the competitors? These are age-old questions that we'd like to sort of actually, like, answer today in about an hour's time. And I hope along with the message of, of the time is now that you really should start, start thinking about the picture initiatives now. I hope you take away, um, you know, sort of the ease of use and the accessibility that modern analytics platforms allow just your regular business analysts to sort of leverage and use so that you can answer these, these big picture questions. <clears throat> A little bit of background on Kiris. Who are we? We are a, a big data and analytics consulting firm, primarily based in New York. We have uh, various teams, and, and we like to see we deliver end-to-end -end strategic uh, initiatives for our clients. 
This could be everything from starting from the back end, building databases or setting up, you know, big data systems, through to the data discovery uh, uh, team, which builds visualizations and engaging dashboards that people can use to, to track their business performance. And then, you know, most recently in the last year and a half, of course, putting the cherry on the cake of, of combining everything and all of our insights together using data science to leverage a lot of the, the, the machine learning and, and advanced algorithmic uh, stats packages that we can apply to, to every business problems. So we work on end-to-end -end projects and I'd, I'd like to, you know, kind of set the stage a little bit uh, with, with what I said about how, you know, some themes that, that we've been picking up in, in sort of the, the market space uh, relating to our CPG clients. If you type, you know, AI in marketing, there's like hundreds of millions of, of you know, Google hits for this, this topic. It's a very, very hot topic. Typically, the marketing teams at a lot of our clients were probably the ones most underserved by analytics, but hopefully by the end of today, we can see how we can leverage a, an easy to use and accessible platform to really solve the, the big pictures. And this is how we would typically structure a strategic initiative for a client, perhaps about a year ago. And this is like straight out of, of one of the sort of roadmaps that I, I laid out for a, a, couple, a couple of clients uh, recently. We would start with like cleaning some data, bringing it into one place, okay, um, you know, building some and, and supporting some standard reports, getting into the self-service and agile visualizations using, you know, the modern dashboarding tools like Tableau, Clicks. Power BI, and then maybe then after we got through all of that in maybe two or three years time in a very comfortable and, and generic way, we would say, okay, now we could start to do some of the predictive analytics or some of the, the optimization stuff. But if you look at what delivers value to the business, is this Y axis, it's really like, you know, the, the, the questions that are going to deliver value are going to be answered by these techniques up here. So in the last probably a year, what happened was all of our clients sort of got their data somewhat in, in the right place or in the right format and started this big shift towards using data science and machine learning to, to do the, the, the bigger stuff. So it's no longer, you know, we can't wait another six months, another eight months, another year to sort of start the initiatives. If you start a project in data science, it'll still take time to ramp up um, design it, you know, sell it to the business, communicate the insights, and then by then it's it's already too late. It's already a year has gone by. So the time to do everything is now. Moreover, we can't solve like these generic things and say we're going to do predictive modeling. Okay, nobody in business will understand you if you say I want to do a data science project. We have to solve very specific problems that the C-level management and and sort of the VPs and everyone can can understand in terms of business context. And that's where we are in the sort of uh, CPG space. CPG stands for consumer packaged goods or in the retail space. These are, these are um, companies that either make or import goods and sell them throughout the US. And there's many points along their supply chain and sales process that have really sort of big picture type of, of value questions that can be targeted or answered with advanced analytics. Uh, last year, uh, partnered with Alteryx, we did some really interesting uh, webinars on supply chain optimization, modeling cost to serve, better forecasting, all of these things that's still like a very hot and ongoing topic. Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on the consumer who is actually buying our products and where are they located. You'd be surprised at how, I guess, you know, sounds like a simple question, but see how we can leverage some of the tools and some of the data within Alteryx to really get answers to that very quickly. And then the biggest theme we've heard probably in the last year is, is anything we're doing like actually working? People spend a lot of money on advertising and promotions. I'm not, not saying that the business doesn't have some directional sort of feel for how, what works, what doesn't, but there's certainly no real quantitative sort of implementation at a lot of our clients it takes a good look at, at what's actually uh, delivering on, on marketing campaigns. And as 
we sort of seen a shift between sort of like a setting up a brand, uh, you know, selling or a sales strategy perspective, diving in now more to understanding who our consumers are, then some of these questions need to be, you know, addressed and answered immediately. How are we going to do this? Of course, we're going to use some data science. I don't want to spend too much time here. Even the audience, the data science is essentially just, I would say, the art of using some algorithms and computers to solve business problems. There's a lot of different topics or, or areas that I would sort of bundle into data science. Some of them are very, very hot topics like natural language processing, uh, analyzing tweets for sentiment and tonality. The majority of, of what we're going to talk about here today can either be done with like simple demographic analysis or applying machine learning. In terms of the data science spectrum, as we go from left to right to right in both complexity and, and I would also say hype, a lot of business processes really can be answered by sort of just living in, in kind of something a little bit more obviously than, than just basic business intelligence, but you know, something very accessible again to if you have the right tools and platform. And specifically here, machine learning will see how that can be leveraged to really build some cool models. We're not going to get into the sort of AI stuff um, that you, you might see some really cool marketing demos where you just speak to a computer and it essentially organizes your entire marketing campaigns for you. Uh, we're going to be a little bit more pragmatic here. So what is machine learning? I would like to think of it as nothing more than an advanced statistical algorithm or process that finds the best way to map a bunch of inputs to an output. So if you gave me all of these points here that you see in the charts, uh, highlighted here in black circles, and you told me to find the best way to describe this data, maybe I would guess, maybe it's like a square root, maybe it's a fourth root, it's kind of steep here, so maybe it's like a logarithm, like shift upwards. That's me trying to come up with a way to describe like the data. Machine learning uses advanced algorithms to sort of find that relationship for you at the cost of actually seeing what that function is. We're not going to worry about it. We're just going to use them and, and the, the machine will pick out the best way to sort of describe all the nuances and nonlinearities in the data. So who can do machine learning? Very hot topic, of course. Uh, data, science, data scientists can do it. Who are data scientists? They're a mishmash of, of all kinds of people from, a, you know, uh, all kinds of backgrounds. I myself came from physics, so of course I transitioned into uh, you know, machine learning and analytics uh, a couple of years ago, and I've been working at Keras for uh, for about three years, where now I head up the data science team. And to actually stand up a data science project takes a lot of, of different insights, knowledge, and skills. You have to be good, yes, at all the machine learning and computer stuff and programming, but the biggest thing we find is you have to have business domain knowledge. You really have to understand the business and the data, and you have to set up clear lines of communication with stakeholders, with upper level management to explain the results and to really think about how those results are used in a real life setting. So that's like a, you know, a unicorn of skill sets. Not everyone has that, and not everyone can actually do the computer based stuff. Luckily, we have platforms like Alteryx these days that could really enable and unlock uh, your analyst's true potential. We've seen regular business analysts, people very good in Excel, but not much more technical than that, capable of picking up the tool and applying some of these more advanced algorithms. To give you a little bit more background on, on Alteryx, I'm going to hand it over to Scott, and he's going to walk you through some of the, some of the platform's capabilities. Excellent. Thanks, Raz, for the introduction, and, and thanks for kicking things off here for us today. Appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Alteryx, uh, Alteryx really is uh, a company and, and the software provider that we focus on providing a complete uh, analytics platform and experience for data analysts, data scientists, and, and, and for uh, even for the folks who, who Gartner describes as, as the citizen data scientists, if you will. Uh, this, this platform is built around uh, four uh, fundamental principles. One, uh, being able to, uh, giving analysts and data scientists uh, and allowing them to create 
data sources that can be trusted and that can be shared throughout your organization. Uh, we find that um, for most folks that uh, uh, one of the hardest things that, you know, or that, that first step of have, you know, being able to trust your data and, and discover data uh, within your organization that, that can be trusted and you can use from the offset that's getting that data ready to go uh, for advanced analytic analysis, that's, that, gets, that can be tricky in itself. So uh, that's where we provide a platform where you can discover and share uh, data sets and also share insights as you move forward and you uh, build your analytic processes. Uh, we allow you to prep and blend data to allow you to, again, taking data from various disparate data sources and allowing you to uh, bring that all together to build a cohesive data set that you can perform advanced analytics on. And again, we, we give you the tools, uh, again, all on the same platform to do that advanced analysis and to do it in a code-free and a code-friendly way. And I'll show you uh, a little bit more of what I mean by that here in just one minute. And then finally, being able to deploy and manage uh, advanced predictive and statistical models here. We uh, we may not touch upon it here today, but one of the uh, things that we've seen from the, uh, from data scientists and from companies around the world is, you know, a number of you um, will build predictive models, uh, and you'll want to actually deploy them and put them into production, but get them into use basically. And it's it's it can be significantly difficult to do that. We find that uh, less than 20% of all the models that are built out there, for the predictive models uh, that data scientists build for their organizations, less than 20% actually ever get deployed. Most of them actually just sit on a shelf somewhere. Well, you know, m metaphorical shelf, of course, because it's not something you can actually put on a bookshelf. But at the same time, most of them don't get deployed. So uh, we, we provide you uh, the tools and the platform in order to actually uh, take data sets, prepare them for analysis, do the analysis, build the predictive models, and then finally deploy those models and share them with, uh, with uh, not only with your, your audience, but also to share the insights that you have, uh, that you discover from your analysis throughout your organization. Uh, next slide, please, Ras. And we found that we'll, we'll talk about this today. Ras is going to show you a few examples of how we help uh, with the data prep and blending step. And we found that um, most organizations, uh, you know, as we move up what we call the analytic stairway to heaven, and we're going into that advanced analytics realm, again, most companies are still struggling uh, a fair amount with just the, the first step, which is the data prep and blending. We've always thought of this as this was the fundamental first step, and, and most organizations here are addressing that now uh, because it's, it, again, if you can't trust your data, if you don't know what your data is telling you and you know where it's coming from, uh, that's going to prevent you from really moving forward with any type of advanced analysis and, and doing any type of uh, predictive modeling, gaining insight into the data. Next slide, please. So what Alteryx does, again, is we provide the next generation analytics platform. Uh, we take data from various different sources. It can be uh, Excel spreadsheets. It can be your data warehouse that you use. You can get it from the cloud, whether you keep all your data on AWS or you're using uh, apps or in the cloud apps like such, such as Salesforce or NetSuite. Uh, we take all, we can pretty much connect to any data source out there, even social media. So if you're tracking information uh, and feedback from Twitter, from Facebook, uh, from LinkedIn, you can bring all of that in. Um, take the different data sets and you can do your preparation of that data, blending all of those different data sets together in one single platform, getting you out of Excel hell. Uh, as, as people like to call it. We also have uh, third-party data sources that you can get access to, such as uh, Experian, the Census, TomTom, um, to help you out with if you uh, are interested in bringing in um, spatial, geographical, demographics, demographical analysis. You can bring that in, and again, all on the same platform, enrich your data sets, and perform the advanced analytic uh, uh, analysis that you are looking to do, whether that be predictive analysis or predictive analytics, um, spatial analytics, uh, you name it, you can do it here on the one single platform. And then finally, being able to share your workflows your uh, and, and share the insights that you are uncovering, not only just within um, your, your group, uh, but with senior leadership throughout the organization. We find that 
it, in, in, in order to create a true culture of self-service data analytics within a company and, and, and get that transformational change done, it's, it's less about the technology and more about the people. And, and people need to share insight. That's, that's when that information really gets, really gets powerful. And so whether you want to uh, keep that all within the platform or you want to uh, share that insight via a visualization tool such as Tableau uh, or uh, Microsoft BI, uh, or you want to load it back into the data warehouse or, or back into a data analysis and just keep it to, as raw data, you can do that all, again, all within the same platform. Uh, that's what we pride ourselves on. Next slide, please. And I spoke about uh, code-free and code-friendly analytics. Uh, with Alteryx, we provide you with a platform that you do not necessarily need to have a PhD uh, and, and need to be a, a full-fledged you know, full uh, data scientist in order to do advanced analytical analysis on your different uh, information here, your different data sets. We provide a simple drag and drop user interface uh, that allows you to uh, create workflows. Raz is gonna show you how to do this here in just a few minutes. Uh, we provide a wide range of tools for you to bring data in, do the analysis, and even do a, a lot of advanced and predictive modeling. Uh, that's all within the platform here. Uh, next slide, please. But I was gonna say, if you are, uh, PhD and hey, you worked hard for that PhD we, and, and, and you want to code, um, you can bring your code in. And, and again, Raz is gonna show you a brief example of how you can bring R, R code, Python, any of the, uh, a number of the uh, advanced analytical uh, uh, coding uh, languages, you can actually bring them into Alteryx and, and perform the advanced analytics right there from the platform. You don't necessarily have to, um, you know, do that autonomously and, and you know, keep building code in R. You can, uh, you can use, you can leverage R code uh, and Python within the platform. And what that allows you to do is, instead of having to start from scratch every time, it allows you to do a repeatable analysis, repeatable workflow that is consistent and you don't have to necessarily step back and start from scratch every time. Uh, and with that, uh, Raz, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you here to get started with uh, some analysis of uh, what Kiris is doing with Alteryx to build some of these predictive models and identify uh, uh, marketing return sources here from, from the retail and the consumer packaged good uh, markets here. Yes, thank you, Scott. Um, so absolutely, let's dive into some, not only some examples and demos of using Alteryx, but let's actually solve some real world problems uh, with this, uh, data is a little fake because we, we can use real customer data, uh, but it is like uh, exemplary of sort of what we've seen going on. Now, the retail and, and CPG sectors are, are what I call a target-rich environment. If you've seen the, the 1980s movie Top Gun, probably most of you have not even been born then, but I love the 80s. Uh, so this is like what Maverick says when he walks into a bar, right? And I, I don't think he was talking about the uh, enemy fighter jets at that point. But this is a this is a sector here that has a lot of different data sources. And if there's ever been a need to be able to consolidate them, manage them, and wrangle them in the proper way, it's it's really in this in this sector. And some of the things to give you an idea of how the supply chain works in the CPG retail space. I mean, you have of the, the actual companies, the vendors and manufacturers. They have a ton of internal data, finance data, manufacturing data operations. Most of it that we've seen is Excel, you know, Excel Hell is, is still very much there. There are a few companies, some of the larger, for example, uh, um, uh, spirits and, and beer manufacturers that we've worked with on a global scale actually are, are essentially, I, you know, big IT companies, they, they have a lot of databases and moving pieces. Uh, they usually sell goods through a distribution system. Sometimes this is managed by the actual manufacturer, like Walmart. Walmart like sends all this stuff to Walmart warehouses and then to the stores. In the alcohol and, and spirit space, they're, they're third-party companies that, that buy the product from the vendors and then sell it down to the accounts, which you get another level. And then from accounts, of course, that's where the consumers uh, uh, buy it from. And everyone, everyone really wants to know what's going on 
in the consumer space these days. There's a big shift from kind of tracking and developing sales strategies in a sort of brand focused way to becoming far more consumer centric. So who are my customers? What are they thinking? What are they saying on social media? It is, is like a super hot topic in this space. But throughout here, you know, very easily to rack up 15, 20 different data sets um, that in some way you have to piece together in, in sort of meaningful ways so that you can do cross-functional analysis. Because if you want to understand what sales returns from your consumers or from your accounts level are impacting your, your marketing and advertising spend, you know, there's a lot of like cross-joining you have to do here. <clears throat> so like we said, when we work with our clients, we try to develop end-to-end -end strategic initiatives with them, we, we, we actually found that if we say we want to do a data science project, it applies. So we have to solve like strategic big pictures for them. A lot of our clients are really large CPG companies. A lot of them are focused in, in the spirits and alcohol space. Um, we're based in New York and there's a surprisingly a lot, a lot of headquarters uh, like here in the, in the Northeast area that we've, uh, companies we've worked with. A majority of the time they're basic, you know, Sales model is essentially boils down to they need to understand who the customers are and then they, they need to understand the best way to sort of reach them so that they can influence their sales. Some of these companies spend about over, you know, $100 million on advertisements and promotions. These are things like TV commercials, YouTube ads, Facebook ads. Um, they could be focused things in the accounts like sampling events, like if you're in a grocery store and you could try different yogurts. Out, or if you're in a liquor store and you can get a product there, there's a lot of price promotions, there's a lot of like sales and so there's there's just like a, a ton of different things companies do to try to uh, influence consumers to buy their products. So we're going to actually answer these two questions. Who are my customers and you know, who, you know what marketing uh, campaigns are actually working using uh, an Alteryx and, and you know in the 20 or 25 minutes that we have left, we'll, we'll see how we can answer these questions. You can imagine the, the pace of delivery of actually uh, getting through to the insights. So for the first question, consumer segmentation, who are my customers? We're going to take sales data and tie onto that some of the demographics data that, that Scott mentioned. We want to identify regions of highest growth or regions where you know, our, our products are actually selling. A lot of this data is offered as an add-on into the Alteryx, uh, uh, into the Alteryx platform. And the neat thing about it is that consumers are already, already profiled by Experian in what they call the mosaic consumer groups and demographics. There's 75 types of consumers. I'm sorry, you are not individually unique enough not to be one of those. At some point, you are going to fit into one of those profiles. And that's why people use these consumer groups to, to sort of um, bucket people into, into types of consumers. So let's take a look at Alteryx. I'm going to tab over here for a second. As a platform, a short introduction and get into solving some of these tools. This is what you see when you open up Alteryx. It's a blank canvas with a bunch of tools at the top. Essentially everything you'd like to do with data is represented by a picture or an icon. It essentially is the smartphone of like, uh, you know, analytics platforms a very like uh, sort of uh, you know visual representation. So everything you'd like to do is represented by a, a different little picture. The learning curve of using Alteryx is really kind of relates to like when you first got your, your first smartphone, how you had to learn what each picture did. So if I wanted to input some data, well, I just drag the input tool down. If I wanted to select some fields from it, well, I just drag the select field down. I can then filter it and perhaps add a custom formula to it and then probably join it on to, you know, another data set that I'm going to bring in from a completely different source. If I wanted to like summarize the data up and then perhaps do like some distance analysis on that data, I could do that all on the same platform. And then like we'll see here today has a, you know, a, a bunch of advanced tools built out for you in, in a sort of our back end where then once I got my data ETL'd and prepped, I can actually start to drag out some of the more advanced machine learning uh, algorithms like random forest, decision trees, and neural networks. So this is what Scott meant when he said that it's a complete analytics platform. You can do a bunch of the, the ETL and data prep 
in the same canvas that you could see a lot of geospatial analytics and a lot of the advanced analytics. This is why we use it kind of on a daily basis at Curious. We use it all the time because it just helps us be faster at our jobs. We don't have to script and debug like kind of syntax of, you know, for getting a semicolon here and there. We can build out very complex logic sequences visually, which, which certainly helps. And then we have access to like all these advanced analytics. So it almost becomes a question of, well, if you're doing all this stuff with data, why wouldn't you do some of some of the, the advanced machine learning? Take a crack at it. It's there for you, and it's very low-hanging fruit. So in, in summary, it's, it's a visual a programming paradigm that really allows you to do things I think that you never thought would be possible before, but also makes you much, much faster at your job. I'm going to skip over some of the initial data prep stuff that uh, uh, I wanted to, to sort of go over uh, just for the sake of time. Just know that we have used Alteryx uh, as an enterprise level ETL uh, sort of platform. That's fine. We've used it there. You know, clients didn't want to get into the advanced stuff. That's, that's okay. But it really shines when you, when you leverage the sort of uh, machine learning and, and sort of analytics capabilities that it has built in because it's so easy to, to blend and prep data together. So let's get into it. The first problem we said was we want to take our sales and sort of understand who our customers are. We're going to do this by taking demographic information that's available as an add-on to all tricks from Experian, from census data, and all that stuff. We're going to take that and, and join it onto our sales so that we can understand in certain regions who's actually buying our products and what type of customer is actually uh, buying our products. Let's take a look. Look at the data we have coming in. I sort of ran this flow for a second, but you know, just bear with me for a minute here. So the data, our sales data is pretty typical. Um, you know, we have like a date of sort of the sales. We usually, you know, ship through a distribution company. That's their name. We're talking about a bunch of products that we're, we're sort of in charge of. These are sort of made up names. So we're selling like some fish uh, stock, selling some coconuts and some French soup and stuff like that. We're actually selling, you know, through the distributor down to the account level. These are the actual store addresses and the cities and, and zip codes that they're uh, located in. We've enhanced this by adding some census sort of anchors or identifiers of which uh, sort of regions these accounts fall into, primarily one called uh, DMA, which are sort of like marketing areas. We'll see that on that shortly. Have some latitude and longitudes, and then really the only, like, metric in our sales data, which is our volume. This could be like volume of pallets. It could be units of, you know, bottles of stuff that you sold or, or a case of beer or something like that. It doesn't really matter. Essentially, it's, it's the quantity of product that we sold through the distributors of this product down to the account level. Okay. We're going to take that and enhance it with some demographics information. Now, like I said, this is a third-party data that's available in Alteryx. And the neat thing about it is that, you know, you can have like a very granular sort of view down to a block level. This is like the most granular sort of geographic entity in this data. A block is like literally my block in New York City. Um, all the demographics information about, about that region or about that geographic level. I'm going to do it at the DMA level. DMA is, again, I'll show you on a map. They're slightly larger than counties, but not quite states. Uh, so they're a little bit different, but you get the idea. There's a ton of, ton of, ton of data that you could pull in by this. So we're going to pull in some basic information. Let's see. Um, I want the age and some educational properties of the people. I want their actual household family incomes, aggregated income, per capita income. That may be interesting. Race and ethnicities of people in there, uh, male-female split, just like a, a ton of stuff that you could pull in. We could pull in actual information based off the survey data of their, you know, consumer and, and expenditure uh, habits. And then, like I mentioned, the mosaic sort of um, clusters and, and groups of consumer types. And then for each DMA level, I want to pull in the dominant consumer type in that DMA. Because I want to understand, you know, on, on average, at sort of a higher level, who, who are really the customers in this, this area? So far, so good. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to pull in that sales data. I'm going to just kind of filter it and, and work on it a little bit. You can see I've added a filter for New York, and I'm just going to pull in some of this and add, add some custom calculations to it. And again, 
the, the ability to, to ETL and prep this data is really, whoops, in, uh, in this click, uh, the, the ability to sort of join these complex data sets together really comes down to just uh, writing out and visually programming your logic flow. So I'm going to join our sales data onto our demographics data by, by DMA ID. My little X is hidden there. Okay. And I'm going to run this flow to give you a sense of yes, this is a visual programming paradigm because everything you want to do is, is done with icons or pictures, but also it's visual programming because when I press play and I start running the query, I sort of see how the data flows through each step of, of the logic at, at each segment. So I could see I pulled in like about two and a half million rows of sales data. I pulled in about you know, only 10 DMAs because I'm only concentrating on New York City area and New York State area. Um, you know, so I, I could see at each point uh, through my filter from two and a half million, I went down to 43,000. I picked only like my top seven products and filtered down to 33,000 lines. And the neat thing about it is it'll, this allows us to like debug really complex logic very easily. I can click on any of these input and output I'll put anchors to sort of see my data each step. So if I click on, if I click on this, uh, screen will pop up, and this will show me a snapshot of the data at that step, right? And after this join, I could click on this again and see the data at that step. So just because you, the fact that you can see how many rows are flowing through is like, it is like a, an incredible ability and, and saves us a lot of time in debugging. More so, out of the joins, I could automatically see the right and the left to orphans that didn't join. So if I have a problem with master data and some ideas don't line up, I know this is my list of, you know, uh, sales data that I can join on. So I could either, you know, fix that here or call like whoever's in charge of this data and take it to them. So at the end of the day, all we've done is sort of uh, build in and, and sort of enhance our, our sales data, which went up to volume, with a, a plethora of, of demographics information, just endless, endless, and I know you're getting dizzy, endless sort of uh, levels of demographic information. And you can see some of that is like what school they attain and what percent are they, male, female, and all kinds of things. That's a lot of data. Let's take a look at what this looks like in sort of a dashboard representation. I don't want to focus too much on the, the tool, but this is like a neat way to sort of see what's going on. So this is a dashboard of that data, not just for New York, but for the whole country now. You can see in the map in the upper left corner, this is uh, th these are essentially what DMAs look like. These are all the DMAs in the country. So they're not quite like states, but um, they're, not, they're bigger than counties for sure. Um, each, each DMA is sort of colored right now by year-over-year -year growth. Or, you know, if, we, if we wanted to see volume per capita, that's like kind of another way of, of looking at the data. Looks like I didn't access this for, for a while, so we could change the metric. In the top right corner, we, we see a, a sort of products chart where we are this year versus the line last year and our, our percent growth per product. And we're going to leverage some of the demographics information in the bottom two charts. On the bottom left, we have the ethnic or racial sort of uh, population split of the data. 70% of our market is, is white population, and we have uh, quite a bit of, of other ethnicities. And then on the bottom right, are these tags, these mosaic demographic groups, which we've mentioned, which are um, essentially, uh, you know, pre-filtered to, to bucket con consumers. So if I wanted to look at my fastest growing demographics group, which looks like somebody called Striving Single Scene, I can actually click on that, get an idea of what DMAs they're lo located in, take a look at my year over year growth, see that they're, you know, they have a, a quite a large subset of Hispanic population, Take a look at two areas and say, you know what, in Phoenix, Prescott, Arizona, I'm actually growing the, down at the bottom of this pop-up at, at over 10%. But in Denver, I'm actually losing. I'm, I'm not growing at all. I'm actually down 3%. What's going on? This is the same population in two different, very close related DMAs. I should be able to come up with an explanation. This is something I take my marketing team. So very quickly, I can get a strategy developed or a story. And now I can go and market to these people specifically. So that's some of the power of, you know, in a matter of like hours that you'd be able to sort of answer these types of questions by using the, the right platform. So let me go back to the slides very briefly, just 
uh, highlight what we said that we've identified actually there's, if we went through, I want to skip over for the sake of time, but there's three demographic groups we want to kind of go after. There's these aging of Aquarius people. We want to maintain them. They're our biggest one. These steadfast conventionalists, we're really losing them, so we got to go back after them. And these new ones that are coming up on the scene, striving single scene. And if I wanted to understand what, what these people or what these groups actually were composed of, I will have the PDF of what, uh, you know, mosaic uh, uh, customer segments are, are sort of uh, uh, grouped as, and I could go to the striving single scene people and, and get all kinds of information of who they are and, um, you know, what sort of media and channels best speak to them. So that's really interesting, and that could help me sort of develop a marketing strategy to these people. And once we have a marketing strategy in place, we want to know if it's working. That's like, a, it's, it's not even a new question. It's like an age-old question. What works? Uh, you know, like we put so much money into different things. What actually works? And these are like some of the same questions that people have been answering in, from the 80s with like linear models in Excel. We want to be able to come up with a marketing mix model, as they call it. We want to understand how much our distribution affects our total sales revenue. We want to understand how much social media contributes to our sales revenue. So we want to link a bunch of inputs to one specific output. This is like just ripe for machine learning uh, applications. So we're going to do this in Alteryx. We're going to do it relatively quickly, but I, I want to show you how fast you can actually build some of this stuff out. We are going to combine some marketing data with sales information. So again, we're going to ETL and prep our data. But then we're going to build a plethora of models on top of that to, to sort of get to this ROI. And the cool thing is, okay, we're going to build a model. That's, that's really neat. Let's pat ourselves on the back. But once you have a model, you have essentially a little simulation that you can exploit to, one, understand what's going on, two, do really cool what-if analysis, and three, optimize. Because if, if there's a way to spend the same amount of money in, in your various channels, but get bigger returns, of course, people are going to want to know how to do that. Now, like I said, traditionally, people have done this with like linear models. That's great. They said, oh, okay, we're going to do a mixed level model and we'll have some linear terms here and then like an epsilon representing, you know, the unknown unknowns that we don't know. And we'll say that's like 3% when in reality it turns out to be 80%. But real life is nonlinear. Your, your response, how much money you put into a channel and the returns you get out of it is not going to be a straight line. It's going to peak and it's going to have very nuanced behavior. So we're going to use some uh, more advanced algorithms like trees and random forests and neural nets. I don't want to get into the details too much, but we're going to use some of these more advanced algorithms to describe these nonlinear nuanced patterns and features in our, in our input data. Before we really do that, you should ask, do we, do, we, do we even need to? Do we want to do this? This is a million dollar question. Because if I showed you the answer between a linear model and a neural network sort of performance, where like a straight line along these dots is like the perfect answer, you could see like, yeah, the neural network does really well at the data, right? Predictive values versus actual. But the linear model is not that bad, right? There's, there's a small like spread to it, but it doesn't do, do that bad. But really where it falls down is when you look at how um, the response is captured as you ramp up spend from zero to, like, say, $4 million in a particular channel. The linear model is linear. It's not going to be able to do anything except describe things for you in a straight line, whereas the, the more complex algorithms are going to be able to pick up these nuances and these, these really kind of neat features um, that, that the other models just not going to get. And if you look at the results, then yes, the linear model will actually tell you, you don't need to spend like $3 million here. You can only spend like a million dollars and get the same return. That is a million dollar question and a million dollar answer. So yes, you should be using some of this stuff, especially if it's so accessible as we'll see. So we're going to have here a mixture between some marketing data and sales. Essentially, our, you know, we're going to tie our data on dates and products. And we're going to take a look at our spends, our actual dollar amounts that we spend in various channels versus some sales uh, metrics and, and KPIs, like distribution and things like that. But essentially, we want to get to dollar volume. So let's, let's take a look at this data. If I told you, you know, we, we could prep, use Alteryx to prep this data, this is what a prep would look like. 
Uh, it's a little bit involved, but you know what? Anyone could take a look at this flow, and because it's laid out in a linear way, they can easily get to it. So if I wanted to start with some of this data, and I'm going to take a look at some of the metrics we have built in here. So some of the things from the media side are things like spend. These are actual amounts in PRPs. These are like measures of how many people re we reach through various channels. Some of the channels we want to spend money on are like cable TV, network TV. Because our Hispanic population, our, our demographic was important, we're going to invest a little bit into Spanish channels. And then from the sales side, we got a whole bunch of stuff from Paul Nielsen, uh, essentially like distribution and percent uh, market share. But our target we want to predict here is our dollar volume. It's essentially our our uh, revenues, and that's that's what we want to do. So if I wanted to build a ma machine learning model using this data set, you can take a look here at the raw data, what it looks like. Okay, it's just kind of all pieced together in a flat sort of file structure, all in the same row. If I was to build a machine learning model, I got to this point, I worked so hard to ETL and prep everything, then it's just a simple matter of dragging out some of these algorithms and uh, going in there and setting essentially what and give it a, a model name, but setting what variable you want to predict against, and I want to predict against dollar volume, and telling it what features to sort of have to go into the model. Make sure you take dollar volume out of the out of the, the feature list, otherwise it will be perfect. And that's it. That's essentially the, the amount of work it takes to build out a, a machine learning model in Altrix. I could run this, and then we could see, you know, the model will run, and essentially we've kind of built out and coded a random forest machine learning algorithm to be able to map all of those inputs, marketing, spend, and sales to the to our revenues. And once we have this model and have it uh, built out, we can really start to play around with it and take a look at what's impacting your things in various channels. Just give this a second to to finish and um, Take a little while. My computer is probably like slowing down. It shouldn't take this long. Of course, everything goes wrong when you uh, running demos. But there it is. It's finished, and essentially we've just constructed a model. It's no more work than actually dragging out the linear model here, the linear regression model. It's the same amount of work. You know, plug that in. If you want to do more models like random forests and and decision trees and neural networks, please feel free to do so. In fact, I've taken the liberty of running six models, including the linear one on this data set. And I was a little bit more careful about splitting it into training and test sets and you know standardizing the data from neural networks and all that. But essentially I could get a performance metric out, which is uh, R squared in this case, of the various models to see how they perform. And like I said, the linear one's not bad, like 0.9 R squared value, that's pretty good. It's not as good as the, the tree method, but that's fine. It's, it's, it's still pretty respectable. Gamma, gamma regression here, no offense to gamma, gamma sucks. So we're not going to use that one, but like I said, the the nuances and the ability to describe features in the data is what's really important. That's not going to come out of a linear model. So in, in a matter of like 10 minutes, you could build 10, you know, five to 10 very complex machine learning algorithms. That's the power and scalability of the platform. The really cool thing is that you can then understand the patterns in the data. Out of the tree-based methods, you can understand things like variable, variable important plots. These will tell you which columns are fields are most important in the model, which get ranked very high as being important. So things like sales metrics, like distribution, actually comes up to be more important than any market, any media spend that you, that you could put into things, right? So you have to be careful how you structure your, your data and what, put, what you put into it. This essentially is your attribution model. And then when we look at response curves of how much money we put into a specific channel and how much revenue we get out of it, you can see these, these really complex features that the other models won't be able to to uh, capture. Since we have a model, we could do a lot of neat things. So one of the things is actually ca calculate the attribution model. So I want to see to what extent uh, my cases per point of distribution actually affects my revenues. I could play games with models now that I have them. I could do what if analysis. I could essentially randomize like the values or take the, the values out of this column and see how poorly I do describing the data. And I could come up with metrics to say, you know what, 25% of our revenues is distribution driven. So before we even think about like media spend, maybe we should think about increasing our distribution in underserved markets. The really neat thing, just to wrap up here, is that once I have my model, the next logical question the CEO or CMO will ask you is to tell you, okay, 
how, how can we best spend our media dollars to increase sales? And we've built like another little flow in Ultra here. It's very accessible, nothing too fancy, but we essentially made an app that perhaps the CEO can access and publish this to the Ultra gallery. For example, we'll allow you to you know, pick, a, pick a product and, and pick a market, let's just do the national, pick a model. And this app will take your input data for say the next month and tell you what your optimized spend should be instead of like what you were actually planning to spend. And it's going to do this by doing like a really kind of search on the, on the model in the parameter space and, and uh, trying many different combinations of spend to actually give you, you know, at the end of the day, a report that says your sales lift, your sales can increase by 13% next month. If instead of spending this much of, of your total spend, instead of spending 55% on, on cable TV, if you took that down a little bit, and if you took down the Spanish channel cable TV a little bit and invested a little bit more in network TV and particularly Spanish network TV, then for the same amount of money, you would get a predicted increase in sales. And that's hugely powerful. That's the type, that's the end game that everyone wants to do. And you've seen that just by essentially being able to piece the data together and then have access to these levels of algorithms that we can actually come back with a pretty confident, um, you know, estimate of, of these types of things. And it'll be far more confident and, and discussion worthy than sort of doing things in a linear model in Excel. Like that's the type of, of thing we're, we're dealing with. So in a matter of 20 to 25 minutes, we did a complete demographics analysis, piece some marketing and sales data together, and essentially built a marketing ROI model we understand the attribution of each of the channels, and we can actually optimize it in a pretty simple way. We don't have to get too fancy, do Monte Carlo and all that. You could actually just do simple grid search if that works for you. And then it'll tell you essentially, instead of doing this, you should do this to, to increase your sales. That's the level of, of ability and, and capability that you, know, you can unleash in, in your analytics uh, environment in, in your company. So the, the all tricks of as a platform, it's very easy to use. It's visual, so you can see everything that's going on. The data pack is great for this customer segmentation and demographics analysis, and I think you'd see that, that some of the, the elements from, from some of the vendors are offered at a very disruptive price point for those. The marketing mix and doing machine learning and doing the ROIs are very hot topics these days. I would suggest that you just do it. Remember, the time is now you have to start doing this because it'll, stay, it'll take some time to kind of stand it up in the organization, and if you don't start now, six months, eight months will pass by, your competitors are doing it. So with that, I think I'll wrap it up, open up the floor for questions, and thank you for paying attention. Raz and Scott, thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder, to, and to answer the most commonly asked questions asked by attendees, uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation from today. Uh, so just diving right into questions here, uh, you guys, this Altrix have um, a, an in database support for uh, DB2 Blue, BLU. Ooh, that's a good question. So all tricks, I'm not sure if it has for BLU. I think I, I'd have to get back to you on that. I, I don't want to say something that may put a foot in my mouth. We have used the in-database tools quite extensively, just not on uh, DB2. I'm waiting. Scott, did you want to <laughs> did you want to jump in on that? I I can yeah. So it, it's I the I. At this time, I do not believe so, but we will we can double check and, and get back to you on uh, specific uh, uh, in database functionality there. So um, this particular questioner said they were like getting in, but do you have documentation or steps for each of the model types on best practices for selecting variables to avoid situations like uh, multi? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to just slaughter that word too, uh, keep people um, new to the space from creating biased conclusions? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So one of Altrix's Altrix's strengths are um, is essentially a lot of documentation. So if I go back to sort of the model 
models, if, if I'm in the, the sort of random forest model, I could always click on question mark and it'll take me to Altrix community webpage that I can start to, you know, read through to, to learn about the, the model and the tool. Every tool in Altrix does this. There is a, a ton of kind of built-in sample workflows um, from everything from mining data to, you know, using demographic stuff to the um, machine learning stuff um, in the predictive analytics to show you examples. And then the best way to sort of understand and, and try to find collinearities, um, there's like correlation analysis tools available in the data investigation tool set. So you can use, uh, you know, Pearson correlation to sort of weed some of those things out. But of course, the best way to learn is just try, try different things. The model, the platform is very scalable. You saw that if we wanted to increase our, our, our data set, like add on some more financial data, add on some demographics into these actual workflows, it's a very scalable and easy, easy platform to, to do that. We're just kind of join things on, and then I just kind of go into the model and, and click the right field that I want to try. So just try things. That's that's the best advice I could I could give. And then use the scalability of the platform to to try and and fail. If you're going to fail, fail fast. That's the message. But don't just build one thing. Don't don't overthink things. Like just throw everything in the kitchen sink in there and take it from there. That's like the best starting point. I think um, that we could say. Of course, you have to be very careful of telling these results. You have to be sure of what you're doing and, and not make sure you're overfit and, you know, have some statistical rigor to everything. There's tools in, in Altrix to help you do that. But part of the fun is just getting to it and trying all kinds of things. And can Altrix connect to a file system like HD Insights? We can. Um, the uh, A lot of our connectors, if there's any questions on um, you know, what, what we connect to and, and, you know, how do you do it and is it native, to, you know, is it built into Altrix or do you need a, a special connector for it? A lot of that is kept in, in two different places. One is the Altrix Analytics Gallery, uh, which is part of the product and, and part of the platform uh, that uh, Altrix provides. And this is a, a complete um, uh, resource center of uh, different uh, starter workflows different connectors, et cetera, uh, that, uh, that uh, analysts and, and uh, data scientists, uh, users of Altrix can, can access while you're in uh, the Altrix platform itself. Um, you can also visit the Altrix community, which uh, is, you do not have to be a user of Altrix to uh, access. You can actually, if you're interested in learning more about Altrix, that's actually a great place to go to is our community. It's a very active community. It's a, and what I love about it is like it, it's, it's, it's a chance to uh, meet with uh, folks just like you from around the world. They're struggling with data challenges uh, and, and helping each other. Um, most of our, if not all of our Altrix certified experts, uh, which are uh, our ACEs as we call them, uh, they are with our end users and with our partners, and they are very active in assisting with uh, folks who are uh, have questions or are looking to learn more uh, about the Altrix platform and you know learning and, and trying to address their different data challenges, whether it be on the, on the data prep and blend side, the advanced analytics side, the deployment side, the connecting to data side. So uh, that's all very active. So you can either visit uh, the uh, Altrix uh, uh, gallery, which uh, the analytics gallery, which Raz is showing you right now, uh, or you can visit Altrix community and you can access that just uh, directly off our website at altrix.com. Uh, and uh, you can find the, uh, at the top of the page there, the, the tab or connector to Altrix community. I love it. Thank you, Scott. So I think we have time to sneak in one last question here. Um, how do you get buy-in from your clients when they don't understand how the models work? So that's that's a great question. Uh, if we can, we try to, you know, like use some simple explanations like for decision trees, for example, we would run that and say, you know, this is just like a complicated like or weighted if-else statement. Um, but basically we we instead try to focus on selling the value and um, the scalability and the reproducibility and, you know, the ability to kind of support this what-if analysis. 
and they will slowly come on board as as they kind of you know sort of educate themselves or skill up on what exactly a neural network is. Um, of course, they have to have trust in the data and, and in the partners and in the platform and in the people running the analysis to make sure that it's it's statistically rigorous. But that comes with time, so we we instead try to focus on on the value proposition. Raz, thank you so much. And Scott, thank you so much again. I'm afraid there's so many great questions coming in, but I'm afraid that that's all we have time for. Um, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the questions and love, and love the engagement. Raz and Scott, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thanks. one.